All right, welcome to the Two Sons Podcast. Today is Wednesday, and it's been, what, three weeks at least since yeah. we released an episode? It, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we probably would have forced it in if there was new episodes of Obi-Wan, but Luke and I have been traveling like mm-hmm. crazy. And then on Saturday, I go out of town for two additional weeks. So it's been... Alaska. L- Alaska, Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> And I've never been, so I'm very, very excited. It's going to be awesome. But we, uh, we've just been really, really busy. But we are going to try to get back on track here. And then Andor is coming out in, I believe, like three weeks or something like that. Is it's it like, that soon? I think it's wow. like early August or something like that. But we have I'm a bunch stoked. of stuff in the meantime. So today today we're going to do a little bit of a recap of Obi-Wan, kind of from like a macro sense. We did, we did end up uh, reacting to the season finale, but we didn't right. really take a chance to like kind of zoom out and take a look at some of the macro uh, ideas and concepts and yeah. really take a look at like how it fits into the Star Wars universe. Um, and then Luke and I both just started this book, which is Thrawn, the first of a trilogy. All three books are out right now. Um, Luke has read the first one before. I've never read any of them, um, but we, we are going to be um, trying to consistently, at least in the latter part of every show, hit on some portion of some Star Wars expanded, not expanded universe, but uh, book. Uh, um, we might get into some expanded universe stuff. Uh, especially as we get into some slower times. Like I, yeah. I think we should do Bane at some point and Plagueis, yeah. mainly just because they're so incredibly important to understanding Star Wars. Right. And, and anyone who doesn't have the time to actually read those books, yeah, like you said, it's so important to understanding Star Wars. The Bane books, in my opinion, should just should just be canon. canon. Yeah. yeah. I don't see... And, and, and hopefully they do at some point make them canon hopefully. in some way, shape, or form. Um, anyway, so yeah, we're going to do, we're going to do some Thrawn at the end. I did want to start, uh, talking about something that I find to be super interesting. Cause like, so uh, a lot of you guys who are going to be listening to this episode found us through TikTok in a video of our wives answering random questions about Star Wars after we had all had, you know, a couple of drinks at the horse track up in, uh, up in Prescott, just like a random kind of thing that we did. And what's fascinating to me about it, and I know this is kind of out of left field, but just like how uniquely powerful social media is now. Right. So like I I work in sports media and I, when I first wanted to get into the business, everyone had told me like, you just got to go bang on every radio station and like beg to work the control board. And like, maybe if you're lucky, they'll let you like come on the the air and yeah like (laughs) maybe every once in a while like the host will need to go to the bathroom and you can hop on the mic for a few minutes and you'll get your chance to shine like you know and then I actually tried all of that and it didn't work right but a big part of it was the industry was changing and so somewhere along the way I just started making content and putting it out there and then that's ended. That ended up resulting in me eventually getting a job in the business. And so, you know, literally started your career as like an NBA analyst. It's insane. Yeah, it's I so know, cool. It's, it's wild, but it, that's what's so cool about this day and age. Is right. like so. Like talent, of, talent will be found. Exactly. Yeah. So, like word of advice to everybody out there who wants to make a podcast someday. Like you. My my belief, and again, there is no one cut and dry way. You can also do this by going through a, uh, a journalism school and getting a degree in sport right. in, in media so that you can go then maybe get a job at a newspaper or something like that. There are many different ways to do it, but one of the ways that I have seen function well for myself and then is already doing well for this show is just fake it till you make it. And what's so interesting and what I've learned this time around different from the first time around the first time around with my basketball podcast i only use twitter and podcast yeah and what's so interesting now is i've learned from the people that run my company that the two uh platforms that the vast majority of americans are on are youtube and tiktok Mm. and tiktok in particular is so fascinating to me because we made that video it's a machine yeah it's a machine it's It's crazy it's insane yeah so like we had 80 followers on tiktok before we made that video and uh, the vast majority of our videos before that were like like little clips of of our show. But then tor- right before we made that video, we had like three videos that did really well because we well did, for us, yeah. well for us, yeah. Because we did we did some little things to kind of chop them up and make them more TikTok friendly, right? And then this video just absolutely explodes, just f- almost for no reason that we yeah. know, of. yeah. 
Maybe. Well, here's what it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> our wives are pretty, and Jason and I aren't. So apparently yeah, exactly. people just want to see more of our wives yeah, in clear, this show. They want to see the wives more than us. That is that is a clear delineation there. Uh, but what was funny is uh, like you can, with a TikTok page with 80 followers, have a video do a half million views. And that is not possible on Twitter that is not possible on other platforms. On Twitter, it, it literally requires a person to retweet your content in order for it to further extend its reach. Yeah. On TikTok, it only requires the person to finish watching it for it to pump into the algorithm and send out to other people, which is such a fascinating concept. It makes it the ultimate meritocracy in the sense that only the good content rises to the top because right. if people watch it, the algorithm will push it out further. And so I've been on TikTok kind of experiencing this for a while where like I'll just sit down on the couch and I'll start scrolling through the rent, the feed and I will see 17 truly incredible things in a matter right. of minutes. So you just got it. So I wanted to hear your initial impressions of what you think of TikTok just so I could get a feel yeah. for it. D TikTok is actually a trip for me. So to, to all of our viewers, uh, I'm not huge on social media. Like I've got an Instagram account. I don't even have Facebook. My Instagram account is like private. Um, yesterday I made my TikTok account private because I got one follower and that scared me just to realize it was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, like who is this A. Huff person? I'm like, is this some family member I don't know? Is that like, Aubrey Huff of this the is, this is scaring me. I'm going to make my, my account private. So I did. Uh, I'm, I'm so weird on TikTok. But apparently... TikTok thinks I hate Mormons <laughs> and TikTok thinks that I really want to see some like pretty girls. Because that's, that's what the algorithm Dude, is recommending Just to nonstop. And like I'll try and like look up stuff on purpose to like try and like change it for me. Or be, skip like, videos. Woodworking, Forerunners, Arizona. Yeah. And then it'll still be like why I hate Mormons. I'm like, what the hell? I don't have a problem with that's Mormons. That's so weird. I've never actually seen an anti-Mormon video on TikTok. Dude, that's I so am strange. in a dark place on TikTok. <laughs> I don't know why. I have no clue how that happened. I like literally zero clue, and it thinks I'm just like eating it up. But like, I'm trying so hard to like get away from that. It's so funny. But dude, it's like like the other day in Vegas, I'm I'm scrolling through, and I see this guy who is legitimately in Lake Powell or uh, Lake Mead, excuse me, the one by Vegas, and he's just he runs around in a in a in one of his boats and is documenting in a really cool way the way that Lake Mead is shriveling up. Oh, and I like, see, yeah. And like showing, like the other day he like found like this ancient U.S. military craft, one of the D-Day boarding vehicles that went off onto the beaches. And he was like showing up close like how it's constructed that was and sunk how it's in That was Lake, sunk in Lake, Lake Mead. Mead. So they had clearly done military training wow. exercises there. And like... Again, just like recommended by the algorithm from TikTok because right. enough people had seen that video and finished watching it. And then we found this unnecessary inventions guy that basically just, t it's totally our sense of humor too. Just like ridiculous. Just ridiculous stuff. Yeah, that he's just 3D printing and making. The point being like TikTok is awesome and we built a following of almost 2,500 followers on TikTok almost overnight with one good video. And it's yeah. a great example of how like, Word of advice to everybody out there who ever has wanted to make a podcast, like cast a wide net, put everything on everything, just record your podcast, do it with right. a camera like this, put it everywhere that it can possibly be and people will find it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so to all of you guys who met us from the, uh, the TikTok page, thank you guys for uh, giving us a shot and giving us a listen. Yeah. We do primarily talk Star Wars. Um, not TikTok, but I did want to, <laughs> yeah. I did want to go on my random TikTok rant. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, so let, let's get started with Obi-Wan. So, cool. um, basically, uh, what I'd like to start with is just, you know, cause the Star Wars canon is such a sacred thing. We were joking about this, uh, earlier this morning because Luke and I went to go see Thor, um, last night with some of our friends and it was entertaining. It was good. Like it made me laugh several times, but like the the movie was absurd. The yeah. plot made absolutely no sense. Like the the whole grand scheme of Marvel's plot now here in Phase Four is completely off the rails. Like you have no idea. Like now Zeus is a is a character in Zeus is a character. Yeah. Like but but like somehow Thor is like a fan of his, but like it didn't exist in his primitive uh, mythology. So the point anything is, anything goes like, pretty much. Anything goes yeah. exactly. But at the same time, like in the Marvel universe, that's just kind of 
accepted. Right. Like it's it's a loose universe. Star Wars is Super so loose. much more sacred. And so like when you do something like you make an installment into the Star Wars universe, there's so much pressure for it to for it to like fit and right. to contribute. Right. And so my my Well it has effect on everything that's happened before it, which is some of the after. stuff that has bothered us about episode seven, eight, and nine of the exactly. movies. Exactly. So let's start with this. Like where is your head at in terms of the actual product that was Obi Wan as an insertion into the Star Wars universe? I think I think it helped it a lot. I, th- I think it contributed to the Star Wars universe. Um, it covered up some plot holes that you and I hadn't even thought about. Um, and overall, I thought it significantly improved Star Wars as a whole. Um, there's been some other shows that have come out right, like um, The Mandalorian and Boba Fett. And I think those have contributed as well. Uh, but I thought that Obi-Wan, they obviously spent more effort, I thought, on Obi-Wan. And, and it showed. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, I I spent a lot of time on Twitter. Twitter it overall is a very negative place. Um, for the record, like, I read a stat a few years ago that something crazy small, like 6% of... Uh, American adults are active on Twitter. So it's actually a very poor representation of the way society actually works. It's people who want to gripe. Yeah, the vast majority of people on Twitter are either very young or work in the media. And so as a result, Mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of emotional reactions to things. And like a lot of, I saw a lot of negativity surrounding Obi-Wan from some of my peers in the NBA media. But like, again, these are... Like a lot of these people are hyper intellectual, very like um, like movie critic type personalities, I see. and like so some of the things that I saw were like like um, this movie added no narrative uh, or didn't didn't do any character development, and what? I'm like that's just false. It developed, <laughs> it, yeah, it developed Leia, yeah, it, um, it developed the Grand Inquisitor to some degree. It significantly developed uh, Anakin. I thought, I it, thought it significantly developed Obi Wan too. Yeah, it significantly uh, developed Obi Wan. Luke Skywalker, not so much. Yeah, <laughs> which which not, wasn't the point of it. Which right? wasn't the point. Yeah, and you got another look into the realm of Grand Inquisitors and and what they do. I thought, I thought it. I thought it very well described Obi Wan's personality in A New Hope because in A New Hope, yeah, Obi Wan is is very at peace with everything. Mm-hmm. Like when he when he is informing Luke about the situation with Darth Vader, obviously lying to him, but when he's informing him about that situation, it's very matter of fact. It's yeah. very like this is what happened. You know, he clearly is not harboring any guilt. There's no, it's like, it's like yeah. a situation that clearly has a ton of closure right. that he's informing Luke about. And, and that gets explained extremely well because Obi-Wan is emotional. Like he's the, the last we see of him is you are the chosen one, you know, yeah. like at, on the beaches of Mustafar. of Mustafar. So like at a certain point they needed to describe how Obi-Wan came to the point where he was in A New Hope. And I thought they did an excellent job of that. Yeah. And that was one of the most powerful parts of the whole entire <laughs> series is when uh, Vader standing there with his helmet cracked open and he pretty much just tells Obi-Wan like I, I made this this is I chose this path this is this is not you and it wasn't like so much him doing Obi-Wan a favor like hey pal don't worry about it we're tight it was more or less just him like almost like just evil to his bones just saying like I wanted this I mm-hmm. chose this even though we know that that's not actually the fact we know that there's always a little bit of good in, in Vader um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I agree like that completely wrapped that up and it made, and it made old Ben make so much more sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Old Ben, old Ben as a character, if you watch it immediately after new hope makes all the sense in the world now, it just, they're all, he just is completely at peace with the greatest failure of his, of his life. And, yeah. and what it took was Anakin looking him in the eyes and saying, it wasn't your fault. Right. And like, I did this to myself. And as soon as that happened, like it was, it, he could move on from it. That scene was uh, incredible. Like, uh, in the past we've talked about how, how just the being a part of the dark side sucks. It, it ruins your body. You can't have any relationships. Like th- there's nothing fun about being a part of the dark side. And it's literally just a big power grab. Oh, a hundred percent. And it highlighted that so well. Like, like Anakin or, or Vader's just pretty much like on his knees 
and he just got his ass kicked by by obi-wan and his his biggest thought is like i hate you and i still want to kill you you know this is like it's only his only driving force at that point and it's just like oh my gosh yeah there is no terrible there is no there was no like uh him getting defeated and then suddenly showing remorse there was not like it was right. like if anything it just made him want to kill him more right. and um, but what's funny about that scene is that was another thing that I saw people complaining about on Twitter was like, oh, it's a ripoff of the scene from Rebels and the scene from Rebels was, the, I saw the ripoff from a scene, I saw people say that it was a ripoff of the scene from Rebels and then I saw people say that they thought Rebels did it better. Now, hmm. to be clear, Luke and I both love the Rebels scene. It's one of yeah. the most powerful scenes in Star Wars. I didn't care at all that they ripped it off a little bit. And th- they ripped it off a little bit and I didn't care at all. One, because it's live action and it's going to reach so many more people. Right. You're just not going to be able to get a lot of people to watch that scene from rebels. It's a cartoon. Uh, it's a cartoon. So from that standpoint, like I was okay with getting a moment like that to the masses. Me too. And then also as good as I thought the Ahsoka scene was, which was incredible. I thought this one was just as good. There was a video that I sent to Luke. Someone had, I'm not sure if it's still up on YouTube because uh, it could have been a copyright infringement thing that got pulled, but there was a video on YouTube of somebody that took the, uh, the entire fight, the last fight between Obi-Wan and Vader and basically superimposed the, uh, the duel of fate song over it and then took out all the filler. So it was just the fight. And I watched that like six times. Yeah, it was really cool. Because it, it's so, so good. And so the, the point is, is that like, like I get the same amount of, I, and I'll just, I'll just round it out to this. And I can, I just am experienced with this on Twitter. Twitter's full of miserable people that love Social media to is full of miserable people. Yes, yes. But Twitter to me is unquestionably the worst place. Yeah. Like there, it is just full of people that do nothing but complain all the time and are constantly unhappy. And so from that standpoint, like I, I, I kind of took those complaints with a grain of salt, but I did want to bring them up because I did think they were categorically false. Like, I did not. Did you have any problem with them ripping off the rebel scene? No, 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 not at all. Mm. Like, like you said, I mean, it was it was really cool to see that in live action, and I like that. There, there's two people I think that they could get away with doing that with Darth Vader. Obi Wan and Ahsoka are them. So, so, so I think they completely within their right to to do that in a live action film. And I'm stoked that people like you know my wife Elaine, I got to see it and you know, people who aren't like super, super into star Wars, but still enjoy it. Like it was just, it's, it's so cool to see the man behind the mask and it makes Darth Vader seem so much more real. Like when we meet him in a new hope, he's very like, calm and calculated and just a big presence. Right. But there's legitimately someone underneath that suit and it's someone who's been tormented. Mm. Right. So it's really cool to see that. Yeah. And you're right. Like Anakin and Obi-Wan are the two people that have the emotional weight with, uh, with Anakin to ever make that. They're his work. family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so moving on to a couple of specific things. Um, do we, well, first of all, let's frame it like this. Do you think there will be a season two? I think no. I, I would be stunned if they did one. I think, I think yes. You think yes? Yeah. So, so, um, and oh man, I hope I'm right. Cause I, I really enjoyed Obi-Wan a lot. Oh, I enjoyed um, it. I would want more. No, of course. I know I'm that. just scared for the narrative stuff. Yeah, dude, they'll figure it out. You think so? They'll figure it out. So yeah, I mean, Jason and I were joking around like, okay, like what's Obi-Wan? Uh, hold series on, hold gonna on be really about? quick. Have you seen any reports about that? No, but I, there's a couple things. I'll, I'll bring that up. Okay, go ahead. Um, Jason and I were joking around when Obi-Wan got released as far as like them doing a show and we're like, what are they going to do with Obi-Wan just sitting on Tatooine? Like Obi-Wan plays the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Obi-Wan, you know, watches pod racing again. Obi-Wan barters with Jawas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean like, no, but I guess, um, I guess, uh, when they're doing an interview with Kathleen Kennedy recently, they're asking about it and she kind of brought up the fact that, yeah, it was intended to be a limited series initially, but they were really pleased with how many people got into it and how it was like one of the most successful um, pieces that Disney Plus had released recently. Um, so, I mean, if the money's there, they're going to do it, yeah. right? And, and the other thing, too, is apparently Hayden Christensen and, and um, Ewan McGregor are all for it. Um, and apparently, and who knows if this is actually true, right? So, um, but apparently they were going to have Reva die in in the final episode and they obviously didn't change their mind so so uh for those reasons i think that there's a pretty fair chance that there is going to be an obi-wan season two so 
to be clear, if they do one, I'll watch it and I'll be stoked. About of course, because but like, I think I think this singular encounter between Obi Wan and, and Vader is plausible enough within the the confines of the original narrative. But them like having like a wild goose chase chase over the course of a decade would not make any sense to me. I see. And are you saying so, like how do they how like do if they... they continued to run into each other? Right. I would have an issue with that because I hear you. It, it, but like so essentially, to what what I would say is I understand uh, this kind of money grab type of motivation from Disney is exactly how they went off the rails in seven, eight, and nine. Yeah, you know, so you have to be super careful with this kind of thing. That said, like like I. I would watch it. It's just I I don't know where else you go from here. And also, they did such a good job of tying everything off. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the only real up in the air stuff is Reva, this yeah. like dark side force user that's now loose in the galaxy. Right. And then there's the the Jedi tomb thing. That and Qui Gon. They didn't really touch oh, and Qui-Gon. The Qui-Gon. Yeah. But like I, you know, I heard people say like, oh, the Qui Gon thing was a tip off for season two. I looked at that more as like we got. Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Now I'm blanking. Um, oh, the guy who plays Qui Gon, Taken, <laughs> Taken man, Taken man, Taken guy. <laughs> you know, Taken. Guy. Um, dude, what is wrong what? with us? Uh, I don't know. We here on the show we're great with names. We could do this. Uh, dude. we could do this. It's no, no, no. Hold on. It's driving me nuts that I Liam can't Neeson. Listen. Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson. Yes, yeah. thank you. I, Gosh. I, I'm. I have like. I have people like tell, like my wife sometimes will be like, you have a good memory. I'm like, no, I don't. I yeah, I'm like trash. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Liam Neeson, I, I looked at it more as like, they approached Liam Neeson and said, hey, would you reprise Qui-Gon as like a as force ghost? And he probably was like, yes, but I don't want to reopen this role. So I will do one, like a one-liner. Or right. And, and I think, and then I thought it made perfect sense for like a Obi-Wan's riding off into the sunset, having established... Uh, that he could protect the children, yeah. and now he's going to commune with Obi-Wan. And they like, walk off hand yeah. in hand. Yeah, and and I I agree with that. And one of the things that we've <laughs> talked about, too, is essentially they had to have uh, Liam Neeson. <laughs> they, had to, they had to have Qui-Gon. Wait, who is it again? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. No, I can't stop like thinking of his name. Um, they had to have Qui-Gon in, at least show up once because of that final scene uh, with Yoda and, and Obi Wan talking about how how Obi Wan's supposed to go and commune with Qui Gon. Yeah, it was it was the low hanging fruit that needed to they, be grabbed. They had to they exactly. had to touch base on it. Like if they if they wouldn't have, people would have been losing their minds. Just, and as far as the Jedi tomb thing goes, like I thought it was purposefully vague. Like right. I I the way I look at it, like we know uh, uh, Sidious's master Darth Plagueis was obsessed with. Um, using basically corpses or near corpses to right. run tests. Um, in general, like he was obsessed with essentially harvesting force energy. There's a lot of different yeah. things that he did there that the Jedi tomb could <clears throat> mean. But and, and the other thing I ever, I thought about, and I don't know if you remember this, but do you remember the scene? I believe it was in the first season of Rebels, maybe season two, where Kanan and Ezra. Um, try to save that Jedi Master Luminara. Luminara yeah. yeah. And then it turns out it's a trap. It was just she was but, a beacon. But or, she was a corpse, remember? Yeah. But the corpse was like weirdly animated with like a force ghost at the same time. Right. Like, it was really strange. I thought that like maybe they're doing stuff like that. I've seen that theory too. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that theory floating around on the internet. Um, where essentially they're just trying to have a bunch of force users, you know, potentially placed areas so then they seek Jedi. Yeah. So like, they're literally just a big fly trap. They're basically, yeah, exactly. They're yeah. like beacons out into the forest. But I, I, I hope they don't make a new season because I, I thought that this was actually very tastefully done this first season. I see what you mean. And, but, and I'm worried that, that they might be pushing their luck a little bit. Right. Um, like but, what other yeah, adventure is Obi-Wan going to go on, exactly. you know, where it makes sense and it doesn't feel like the same exact thing, mm-hmm. but who knows? I mean, I was, pleasantly surprised with obi-wan um but as far as like the jedi tomb thing there's there's the whole entire like fly trap idea right where they're trying to lure in force users jedi previous padawan whomever in order to to try and you know uh, snuff them out essentially but then there's the other side of it too where we know that um they were trying to obtain grogu right and oh. and then there's the other part of it too where you're talking to about, get his like, blood yeah, Palpatine's um, 
drive to like create life essentially and to tend to live for forever. Um, and I think that's probably actually the biggest prize. Like, yeah, the luring Jedi thing, yeah, that's kind of cool. But as we know, most of the Jedi are gone. I, I, I honestly think the big thing there is them trying to like wield the force in, a, in like an unnatural way. Yeah. So in, in the third Bane book, um, Darth Bane becomes very like worn down by the dark side of the force. And he becomes uh, obsessed with finding this Sith Lord named Darth Undedu. Um, who was ruled a planet in the ancient uh, uh, Sith Empire where he had uh, figured out basically the the concept of essence transfer, the ability to oh, transfer yeah. his consciousness into another. And, and then you see that expanded on with Plagueis and the idea of immortality. But the Sith have constantly been obsessed with the idea of immortality. And it makes sense because they're the most powerful force users in the universe. And also, if you even go beyond that, like almost every... Almost every famous Sith Lord, like Naga Sadao or, or any of these guys, it's like it's like their story involves like this second phase where they're like a apparition that appears in a oh, tomb right. and, oh, like, yeah, yeah. When and like tries to help other Sith or, or, or tries to steal other Sith's life essence. Like right. they're just it's a constant theme throughout the, the the history of the Sith that they're obsessed with immortality. And so they will do things like harvest the corpse of a force user in hopes of one day you know in, in person like literally like it um uh, what's the word i'm looking for assuming like, like yeah, assuming their their their, their, their body their corporeal form or whatever yeah. you want to call it yeah so yeah i i, I thought I, I think it's super interesting um uh, but i did think they purposely left it vague like i don't think that was like an easter egg i thought it was more of just like a what right. are they doing here i you think know? i wouldn't be surprised if we start to see what that jedi tomb is more in the third season of mandalorian I think that would make sense because I would the, love for them to yeah. hit it in that capacity. And the hot, yeah. the hot thing right now that like Marvel has really done is they're trying to make everything relate. Yeah. Right. So, so like we saw in Boba Fett and uh, we saw in Boba Fett, like it heavily related to Mandalorian. It was essentially Mandalorian season 2.5. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, so I think that that's probably when we're going to see more of like, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of like why that tomb is there. And there's probably other tombs, I, I presume, mm. uh, throughout the galaxy. So you had wanted to hit on uh, Bail Organa and his relationship with the Empire. Yeah, no, right. I mean, it's just kind of an interesting thing because um, there's, we've talked about the, like the actual inner workings and like the legitimacy of the Sith and how they rule governments. Um, so, so it's like, yeah, you know, Palpatine wants all the power, He's evil, but then there's still a galaxy that needs to be run, right? And uh, that's done in the form of, of senators. And it would be really interesting uh, to know, like, Bail Organa's thoughts on, like, his relationship with the, with the Empire, having known that Inquisitors, which are essentially paid employees of the Empire, like, legitimately abducted his daughter yeah dude <laughs> like like and i'd like to know like you know i don't think we'll ever get this answer or maybe we will if there's ever like a book about obi-wan or, or a book about bail organa but it's just like how do you have a working relationship with a government that abducted your child dude it's like it makes no, it doesn't really make a lot of sense but you almost have to because the empire is so evil and he knows it well, they got turn a blind eye. Remember when everybody gave George Lucas crap for like talking about the intricacies of trade routes in the in the prequel trilogy? Oh yeah, right. I never had an issue with that. No, because it makes like, sense. It has to be there. That the the beauty of the grand plan, which was the plan of the Sith to overthrow the Republic and the Jedi, is like it's remarkably detailed and well thought out, yeah. and it all makes sense. Like, and and that's my thing is like the it it, it extended to okay now, uh, you know Darth Sidious is in the chair. And the Jedi are dead or dying or on the run. Yeah. And now it's, you know, uh, like, just like he says um, to uh, Vader after he knights him, he goes, and we shall have peace, you know, because like yeah. this whole thing is like peace through order and fear, you know what I mean? And so essentially, yeah, like you have this, uh, uh, if you think about what the 
Um, if you think about what the galaxy is, it's a very similar construct to a, a, a typical republic like the United States, where you have these entities, these 50 entities that are the states, and they have their own local gov- municipal governments, right. like even down to the cities. But like the governor is in charge of Arizona. The state right. senate is in charge of making laws in the state of Arizona. The state house of representatives is in charge of, you know, and there's state courts that justify that based on the Arizona constitution. All of that is there. Um, but then we have these representatives in the form of our, sen- our senators and our, our, our uh, um, congressmen and congresswomen who then go to Washington right. to represent They're us. They're supposed to go to bat for To us. Advocate, uh, advocate for us right. on, on the federal scale, right? right? So that's kind of the way it is. And so the Senate was how Palpatine controlled the Republic. Uh, uh, and so he needed them to be on their side. And that's why, like, and it makes perfect sense. Like Reva does something like kidnaps a Senator's, uh, um, daughter. And they're all like, yo, you can't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. And then Bill is no, just no. like, all right, this is awkward, but I'm just going to like allow this to happen. Cause I mean, you can't, he couldn't fight against that. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Like he, he needs to do his job. He's, he still needs to be a dad. He still needs to protect his people and his family. So, and even, even further, what's so cool about it is like, and we're going to learn about this a lot in Andor, I think, but you can see the rebellion is starting to form amongst the Senate, right? And um, and and if you remember, the uh, there's a line from Leia in A New Hope where she looks at Grand Moff Tarkin and she says, "The more you tighten your grip, the more systems will slip through your fingers." Essentially saying, like, the meaner and more and more, uh, you know, ruthless you get, yeah, people are going to hate. More you. people are going to turn right. against you, right? And and what? But the the funny thing there is, there's a race taking place, and the mm-hmm. race is the race that's in Rogue One, which is like, we need to finish this Death Star and get it operational in time. Uh, before the the Senate rebels against us, yeah. because as soon as the Senate, and you can see how, like literally, a uh, um, if the if a New Hope had gone south, had they failed to destroy the Death Star, essentially the Death Star would just be trolling around the galaxy. It's like. Up oh, rebellion over here. Okay, destroy their planet. Okay, over here, destroy their planet. Like the idea the, too of just like a big orb just going through space, yeah, just just being around planets. Just yeah, just it's kind of funny. Everybody, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but but, but it that's, works. That's the thing is like it, it, it like that made sense. And in that in that scene from A New Hope where uh, where Grand Moff Tarkin is like you know the Senate has been dissolved, Re- regional governors will maintain control over yeah. the bureaucracy and we will and fear will rule the galaxy like yeah. it, I, I love that george lucas took the time to break that stuff down to me that's what makes star wars star wars well and that's how intricacy. it yeah exactly and that's how it differs from like the marvel marvel movies mm-hmm. could you imagine if they tried to get into trade routes during Dude, a, oh, a marvel gosh. movie that'd make no sense like it'd make no sense in that in that context yeah no absolutely so the the last thing you wanted to hit on from this was hating christensen and acceptance which i thought yeah. was really interesting no so i've go got ahead. a little quote from him which i thought was really cool and it says it's been so heartwarming for star wars fans to finally embrace me i guess the moral of the story is patience um i thought that was kind of cool because throughout time especially during the sequels uh whoever plays the role of anakin skywalker has just gotten dumped on right so little anakin uh a lot of people didn't like that character and then even like older teenage anakin becoming um uh, like a Padawan and a Jedi, like people really didn't like that character too, for whatever reason. Like the prequels got a lot of crap and then for some reason they just aged well, which was kind of unexpected. So it's, it's, uh, I'll tell you why, because we actually got to see what a bad Star Wars movie looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Episodes seven, eight, and nine came out and everyone's like, you know what? The prequels actually aged like fine wine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, George, George Lucas made three That's a really good point. absolute classics and set this ridiculous standard. And then, and then a couple of like, pretty damn good movies came out following that up and we were like, hmm, this isn't good. But then we saw Kathleen Kennedy get her hands on this and we're like, oh, George, we're sorry. <laughs> we're sorry. But it was kind of cool because like uh, for him to carry himself well throughout time was really impressive too. Like from what I remember, like when people were giving him a hard time, he never like posted some BS on social media, which really wasn't a big thing then. Um, but even following that, like he just kind of stayed quiet and was his own person and like never complained. And then, and then it's cool because then 
it got released that he was going to be in the Obi-Wan series and everyone's like, hell yeah. And Dude, I was like, dope. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It's got to feel so good for him to like come full circle. But it was also really cool too that he kind of threw out the whole entire like Jedi vibe, like, oh, like the key is patience, you know? Like, yeah. That was a very classic. It was just like very classy. I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm pro Hayden Chris, Christensen. I am a fan. Oh yeah, um, for sure. The, yeah, the, the other thing too is just, just in general with this kind of thing, like I feel like we start, this is where Star Wars fans, kind of like we were talking about at the beginning of the show with the, the complainers that I saw on Twitter, like there is a fine line. Like when Luke and I complain about Star Wars, we, I mean like really complain there's usually a good reason. Right. Like we had we had nitpicky things with the Obi Wan series that we would share in our airing of grievance segments right. in, the, in the pod. But like we never had any major issues. Like the like we'll like we'll we'll enjoy Boba Fett and we'll be like, yeah, the Vespas were kind of corny. Yeah. You know, like that kind of thing. But like we were reasonable people. The things that we got upset about in the sequel trilogy were truly like, like galaxy in, in defen- altering yeah galaxy altering events. indefensible things to do right. like when the opening scene from a new hope is you um luke trying to convince han to just punch it into hyperspace and han says no i can't because we'll, right. be, we'll be spread over five systems from running into something right i have to do pre- precise calculations and then you want to do light speed skipping like <sighs> oh we're all going to look at you like what the hell are you doing you right. know what i mean and so that was a cheap thrill you can get away with that in marvel movies and this is not us hating on marvel movies but <clears throat> keep in mind spoiler alert in thor there's literally like a converted Viking ship that was for tourists that's being pulled through space by goats. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, so like uh, again, spoiler alert, sorry, it's so but, funny. but, but like, let's just not do crazy stuff like that in star Wars. Like yeah. we don't want that. You yeah, know that's I mean? okay in Marvel, not okay in star Wars. Yes. Like, yeah, so like, then when you start like, like skipping into the atmospheres of planets between and, buildings. Yeah. And, and where there's like, I think if I remember right, there's like a big space slug that's like, yeah, doing like point. a big chomp. And it's just like, let's not do that because it was the space slug, like just randomly like eating air, hoping that someone oh, would dude, drop into hyperspace right in its path. And like, then like, like we have very analytical brains. So the whole entire time I'm thinking like, well, number one, that's ridiculous. Number two, they'd shoot themselves into a star. <laughs> and, and number three is the chances of them ending up in an atmosphere like three times in a row is almost zero mm. let alone one one it, time is it, almost exactly zero. so like it, and just and that that's the stuff that like you know it literally rips me out of star wars universe oh well do you remember do you remember the uh in um in the high republic series how they talked about how during that assault on the republic fair how oh. all those ships are popping out of hyperspace in the atmosphere. Yeah, the which Nile. was which was specifically because they had those secret paths. Right. And the Jedi were confounded because they said a ship is incapable of exiting right. hyperspace and, in the atmosphere. It would explode. And even with their ability to do that, they were still losing ships. Yeah, because a of bunch how of them were crashing. Yeah. Exactly. So it, that, like that, it, the point is, is like we we had a pretty pretty low bar that they still went underneath. Right. So my point is, is like. There are real reasons to complain about Star Wars, and then there are fake reasons to complain about Star right. Wars. Like, okay, so you think that the little, the ten year old boy that they got to play Anakin was a little bit like, uh, you know, iffy as an actor? Sorry, buddy, get over yourself. Like, right, exactly. Yeah, like, like, okay, was Jar Jar Binks a little cheesy? Yeah, but the overall vibe of the movie was excellent. Like right, the, and and that's the part where it's like, I think what happened was is Hayden Christensen was a victim of an entitled Star Wars fan base Probably that expected so. everything to be perfect. And so there I think it's important to draw a line between entitled Star Wars fans and us. And for the record guys, if we ever reach the point where we're acting like entitled, Please entitled call Star us Wars fans, call us out on it, yeah. you know, but like I feel Cause like Cuz that's not what the show's line. about. This show is supposed to be there to like analyze Star Wars just because <laughs> like like I said Jason and I have very anal- analytical brains. So like mm. yeah, our our uh, point of the show is not to like talk trash on Star Wars or to talk trash on like producers or directors or actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, like that's just not our vibe at all. So like yeah, please call us out. But um yeah, I don't know. But yeah, but with Hayden, with Hayden Christensen, he's a victim of that. Oh yeah. And, and as as far as I'm concerned, like I'm just thankful that he got his little his little redemption because he did I thought he did a just fine job. And and I never had an issue with the way he did in the prequels. Like no, I, and I thought I thought he played the angsty, overpowerful teenager perfectly. vibe perfectly yeah. in the in the original in the or in the sequel, prequel trilogy. 
Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to hit on from Obi Wan before we move on? No, I'm good. Cool. So quickly before we get out of here, we're gonna um, just kind of dip our toe into this Thrawn book. So for the record, there. there there are a lot of Star Wars expanded universe stuff in Star Star Wars books. Like for instance, there's a a trilogy of books that was um I believe it the first book is called Aftermath, but it's a book that it's a series of books that explains the basically the rise of the first order. And doesn't it try and like cover up issues from episode seven? <laughs> it does. Nine? Yeah, it tries. <laughs> but like we'll probably not read that. Why? Because like I just have no interest. Well, I read all three books, but we're probably not gonna get into that on the show because Star Wars fans, you don't need to. Like if you need weird explanations for the ridiculous trilogy that was the Star Wars sequel trilogy, then by all means go, go, go nuts. But like, I don't think it has the same like impactful weight that some of the other books read. Like yeah. we're going to read the Bane trilogy because it intricately describes the origin stories of the modern iteration of the Sith. Right. The, and Plagueis expands on that. Like we're going to read the Thrawn books because Thrawn is not only a very, very interesting character in the history of the empire, but I also expect him to be a major character in in the Ahsoka TV series so. that's coming out. I hope so, so. There's a lot of important stuff to get into there. Is there, other than this, do you want to just kind of really quickly kind of lay out what his character is like in Rebels for us? Oh, yeah. So, and you watched all of Rebels, right? Yeah, I've so, seen it all. So, Thrawn is a incredibly meticulous and calculated um being right and and it's it's so cool to see that in in rebels because every single time that you see thrawn in a scene it's almost like okay thrawn's here whoever's against him has zero chance right and it's just it's it's because he's so calculated um and it's almost like unnatural but then you get to start reading the book and then you get to meet the race of aliens named the chiss and they were known throughout the galaxy to just to be exactly that, like extremely cunning and calculated um, and even like cutthroat in any time that they're in any type of competition with with someone else. Um, the other thing that's really, really cool about Thrawn's uh, alien race is that they have the ability to see minor inflections of of like physiology. Heat. Yeah. yeah. Well, and heat. So like if someone's like embarrassed or angry, like Thrawn's able to see that not only in their facial expressions, but in like legitimate heat signature that's coming off their face, mm -hmm. which would be incredibly powerful um, if you're analytical like Thrawn is. So, um, and it, it's cool to see his like rising story too, because you know, like where, where did Thrawn come from? Like, right. Like it, all of a sudden he's just, you know, an admiral in the Imperial Navy. And he's like one of the only that I'm aware of that's not a human. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how that, that came to be. So like to start, what I think is really cool is there are a bunch of different kinds of villains, like villains in, in movie and book history. Like there's the brute force villain. Think like, uh, like Thanos, where it's like, he's just this immense, powerful presence and then there's like the, you know, like the mystical power villain, which think like Palpatine, like this shriveled up old man, but he just has this immense dark side power. Right. But then there's also like the, the, um, the genius military general yeah. role, mm -hmm. you know, and you see this, uh, it's, it's, it's underrepresented in this kind of thing because I, in this kind of media, because I do think it's a super interesting type of character that we yeah. don't see often enough. But the idea of like the chess master, right. the man who does not have a power, although uh -huh. he does have a little bit of like chiss physio physiological power, but like doesn't have a power to speak of and yet is immensely powerful based, based so strictly cunning. on str strategy. You know what I mean? Dude, it's kind of funny because I just thought of this. Um, and, and this might be a stretch and I get that, but... Uh, Admiral Thrawn reminds me of the Joker in Batman Begins. That's a great... I was just thinking Batman villains. Really? Like, Batman villains that don't have power. Like, yeah. that kind of thing. Like, the yeah. Joker, like, he's always a step ahead. Um, and he completely understands uh, conversations. Like, like Thrawn so deeply 
uh, pays attention to like every single conversation he's mm-hmm. in. Um, and that, that was the Joker. Like the Joker like knows how to read people and he knows what they're going to do. And that's, what's amazing about Thrawn. The only difference would be that like th- the Joker's like disheveled and Thrawn right. is not. But yeah, I, I agree with you in terms of the overall vibe and in the way that he almost like toys with people psychologically. Right. Um, so for those of you guys who have not read Thrawn, we are going to dive into some spoilers here. Now, to be clear, I'm, we're just going to be talking about the initial sequence of the book today. So you're not going to be overly uh, um, spoiled by any stretch of the imagination. So maybe you'll want to hear this as just kind of like a little dip your toe in it kind of thing. But I do feel obligated to disclose that we are going to start talking about the book. And yeah. then what we're going to do is every episode from here on out, we're going to hit another chunk of the book uh, in, in in coverage. So, so the, the, what we're going to get into today, uh, really briefly... Um, because there's not a ton to get into is essentially this book opens up on a planet where, um, a creature, something is toying with the empire and, and like killing, I think roughly a half dozen soldiers and pilots and kind of in a jungle too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like heavily wooded. and, and And the empire is there. Um, looking for what, what I can't remember. They're there. I think they were there because they had heard about a mutiny, or, or they were there looking for a translator. It was something like I can't remember exactly what the reason was. It was something odd. It was it was like yeah. very like low level am- empire. Yeah. Like it felt just like regular routine exactly. government type military work. L- low level military operation on this planet. Like at one point there were no stormtroopers there. Remember, right? And so he like. He like screws with them enough for them to send stormtroopers because he needs stormtroopers in order to enact this other part of his plan. But then eventually he basically surrenders. Right. And it turns out he's Thrawn and he kind of, um, he, this is, so this is where I thought it would, it would well, be interesting to start. Go and ahead. he's there because he was outcast by. Yeah. The that's Chiss. what I was just going to say. Yeah. So oh, okay. where, where I wanted to start with is the first thing we learn is this translator. There's a translator that speaks Thrawn's language. And Thrawn speaks a little bit of basic, but not enough. Right. And and basically what he says is like the Chiss are these military geniuses. They're tactical geniuses. They're all of these things, but they're also freakishly loyal. Mm-hmm. So for them to have kicked this guy out, something's weird with this guy. Right. And, like, and, he, and he says at one point, they're exceptionally ruthless too. So it's really strange for them to kick this guy out. So the first thing we learn about Thrawn is he's too crazy for the Chiss. Right. Which is wild. And then apparently the Chiss are not extinct, but like are few and far between. It's almost like they've tried to just be out of the way and and not really be known throughout the rest of the galaxy. Mm. That was It almost seemed like tactful too. Like, hey, like we don't want to be known. We don't want to deal with trying to defend ourselves. Like... We're this ultimate power, and we don't need to like have trade routes with Naboo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know they're very, I mean? they're very isolated, <laughs> right? Um, and but he, and it does seem like he wants to go home. It seemed like something he might have said something like that. I'm not sure if they, but um, or maybe, maybe not. I can't. It, it, the, he seemed accepting of of them not wanting. Gotcha. His insight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're very we're very early in the book, and Luke's read it before, but I haven't. Yeah. So he's a little ahead of it. Oh, but, that's right. I do have a different like. S- yeah, you have a little bit more yeah, perspective. Okay. Right. But so, uh, uh, but Luke has not read the second and third book, so he will get to react new to that. But the, so basically, to make a long story short, he uh, they're ta- uh, the, the 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 military officer for the Empire that is in charge is so intrigued with Thrawn that he wants to take him to the Emperor. And that's after he, he like took down, I don't know how many ships. Yeah, he crashed a bunch uh, of ships, killed a bunch of soldiers, and right. then immaculately describes to the general how he did it. Remember? Right. And it's like, <laughs> exactly. it's like, like at one point he like captures a pilot and steals his transponder, but then kills another pilot and then swaps out the transponder. That was the coolest he part. Because know, he knows they'll block out that transponder so it'll allow him to keep t- tabs on their communications and and like little things like he knew they'd take these berries that would draw rodents into the camp. Like li- yeah. all of these like little detail. like he just, he basically just screws with them. And then he's like, but it was really easy. He's like, it wasn't that hard. Yeah. <laughs> and then at one point they're like, wait, you killed that stormtrooper just so that, or you killed that soldier just so that they would send stormtroopers. And he's like, yes. Yeah. And he's like, it was a necessary loss, which I regret, regret or something. Yeah. Like that. Something like that. And yeah. But like, uh, and so the, where, where we cut off before, before I stopped reading, uh, was he was on a transport on his way to Coruscant with this translator and, 
and they're just kind of talking. And the main, the last thing that I wanted to get into is just the opening sequences of the book. I thought did a good job of capturing Thrawn's methods, Mm -hmm. meaning like one, the way he toys with people with strategy, but secondly, the way he toys with people psychologically in conversation. Right. He's constantly reading your inflections in your voice and in your body temperature and in your breathing. Right. And and everything he it just seems like everything he does is manipulative and serves yeah. a distinct purpose. Which which is so incredible. Like so it blows my mind when authors come up with this stuff too. Because for for the author to like portray Thrawn, like when you're reading Thrawn, you're like, oh my gosh, like Thrawn's so smart. It's like, no, the author writing this is so smart. Like they have an incredible mind. Um, so it's so cool too. And like one of the things that's unique in this book is um, it talks about Thrawn's thoughts during conversations. And and it's so cool because it does talk about like inflections of voices and the raising of an eyebrow. And it's so funny because like as I'm, uh, going through this book and as he's like uh, describing what people are doing as he's watching them during conversations like I find myself doing the little stuff with my face <laughs> and then being like yeah that does you know like that is a facial expression of like pondering <laughs> it's like so bizarre so I'll be, I'll be like I'm doing the audiobook and I'll be like sitting in my car and I'm probably like doing like weird stuff with like my face. So I'm like, oh yeah, that is a pondering face. That is an angry face. You know, it's so funny. The audiobook's excellent too because it's the, um, and the, this is a, 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 a voice actor that we've heard before because he did the High Republic book that we just read. And he does such a great job of impersonating Thrawn's voice. Too. Yeah. Like it, all in all, to kind of put a bow on it, I'm already hooked. Yeah. Which the High Republic books took longer to hook me because they did so much character development. I, I, having seen Rebels, I think, helped because I've already liked Thrawn as a character. But this book does... You can really see inside Thrawn's head and I think it's going to be really important when we get to Ahsoka. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying it and I'm really excited to continue working through it. Thrawn's... Uh, Thrawn's... Too incredible of a character for him not to show up in the live action. I and I I and speaking of low hanging fruit and stuff like if you're if you're storyboarding an Ahsoka TV series, it starts with okay we have Ahsoka, mm-hmm. we have Ezra, right? We have Thrawn. Where do we go from here? Right. That to me That's is the other thing. Yeah, Ezra that, might be showing up in exactly. Ahsoka. Yeah. So like that to me, if I'm Dave Filoni and John Favreau and I'm advising on that project, to me I'm like, there's your starting point. You're working around that. Like, you're right. not going to in- introduce a new villain for Ahsoka. It's going to be Thrawn. My I guess so. is he's going to be like, so, and then, like, not to get too much further in the weeds, um, but like, the after the death of the Emperor and the destruction of the second Death Star, the Empire basically fractures as yeah. all of these higher ups start trying to grab power. Kind of like Moff Gideon in, in The Mandalorian. Next. Yeah. Thrawn will absolutely be one of the generals who grabs power. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so from that standpoint, I, I I see that being kind of a core plot point in, in the Ahsoka I really series. hope so. Did you have anything else you wanted to hit from the first no. uh, couple chapters? No. Nope. Yeah, that was, that was it. Alrighty. So that is all we have for today, guys. Like I said, we're going to be... Um, our next episode will likely just be Thrawn based. Um, we m- might mix in some movie stuff. We're going to be doing because I think August twenty second is the start of Andor. We're going to get into. Um, uh, we're going to do some movie rewatches too. I think Luke and I want to do a, a something cool surrounding a rewatch of the sequel trilogy. Just because oh, yeah. it's so horrifically bad that I think it'd be fun oh, to, to it's rewatch. Be painful. I go out of town from this Saturday for two weeks. Um, so we might not have an episode until after that. But when we get back, we'll, we'll get back into it. As always, we appreciate your guys' support and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot.